Hi friends! Before I jump into this week's vlog, I did want to take some time to talk about what happened this week because I feel that if we do not talk about it, then we are complicit and we are part of the problem. I know that reading for so many, just like me, is a place for escapism, but it has also been such a powerful tool for education for me as well. I grew up in a very conservative family. A lot of my family are still Trump supporters and reading gave me access to information that I did not have growing up. It gave me a whole new outlook on life. It made me a more compassionate, more intelligent, um, more educated person in every aspect. And because of all the research and reading and soaking up different experiences of America, this moment in American history is terrifying for me and for everyone it should be, and I think it is, in a lot of ways. But almost more so, it has not been surprising. It's been entirely predictable. When Trump won the presidency in 2016, I think a lot of people didn't understand why so many people were vastly upset. And this is why. One of the main reasons for my disgust this week is that black people are shot by police for simply existing. That is a fact. But when white nationalists, white terrorists stormed the capital of our nation, the police aren't only complicit, aren't only inadequate, they are a part of it. They allowed this to happen. They partook in this. And if you do not see that, then, then you're blind. It isn't a matter of not having enough resources. They get billions and billions of dollars every year from our government. They are part of this terrorism event that happened. And sadly, if there aren't any consequences for the terrorists, for the police, for the politicians that were complicit, that helped incite this moment, if there aren't severe consequences for them, this will happen again. This will happen every time there is a political decision that they do not agree with. And the most heartbreaking thing about all of this, about this week, is that I, nothing will happen. Based on our history and our responses thus far, nothing will happen. No one is going to be held accountable for their actions for this moment. GOP members, they, they've already started doing this, but they will try to distance themselves as far away from possible from Trump and his supporters, even though they stood by his side for the last four or five years and they will give a half-hearted speech saying they condemn this when all their actions leading up to this point prove otherwise and we must not forget that. And this problem will end when Biden is president. It will end the day that he's inaugurated. I sure wish it would. <laughs> and I know I see a lot of people just saying, oh, we'll just wait, it's fine. It's not fine. This is, this is just the beginning. A new presidency will start. People will be calling for peace and unity and push the past behind us to move forward when that will only move us back into a very more dangerous place. And this will just help uphold the status quo that has been in our country for so long. The status quo that funded police, that causes insurrection, that continues the genocide of black people in America on a daily basis. That's what we are upholding and nothing will change. The system won't change unless we completely overhaul the system and end the corruption. And I really, I hope so badly that we can do this. I hope so badly that it can happen. To be honest, I'm not feeling hopeful at the moment, but I think the more that we speak up, we have these discussions, we educate ourselves, this just change can happen. We can't stop fighting and for me, a large part of that is by speaking up, but it's also by constantly educating myself. So I'm going to be putting a bunch of resources in the description below. Um, some books you can read to help further your education, some resources to help make America a safe place, to help change this country for the better and actually make real change. So 
check those out. And if you have any questions or want to discuss this at all, I'm always in my comments. Please, let's have a discussion below. It's a safe place. And with all that being said, let's get into the vlog. Hello, good morning. Welcome to my second reading vlog. Um, thank you so much to everyone who watched the first one. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Today is Saturday morning. Probably gonna take it easy a little bit this morning and just kind of watch some YouTube and just kind of veg out because this week has been uh, really hard for my mental health. So I think I'm gonna focus on that today. So I'm gonna watch some YouTube, do some yoga, go on a walk and and then read. Um, I am reading two books right now. The first one is The Babysitter by Liza Rodman. And this book comes out in March and it was one of my most anticipated books of the year. But this is a nonfiction book that is basically part memoir, part true crime book. This is a story about a girl who grew up um, with kind of like a babysitter. Um, it wasn't like officially her babysitter, but she spent a lot of time with him and he like took care of her because her mom was kind of MIA. Um, but he ended up being a serial killer. So that's one half of the book. And then the other half of the book is from more of a true crime perspective telling his life story. So it's been pretty interesting so far. The second book I'm reading is A Prison by Any Other Name. And I just finished reading The End of Policing. And so this is a really fitting book to read after that because it's like, okay, get rid of the police. Now what about the prisons? This calls for, I mean, it's basically kind of the same premise as The End of Policing. It's taking all of, um, kind of the half-hearted calls of reform for the prison system and saying why they don't work. I'm learning a lot of things that um, I haven't thought about before, so I really, really appreciate that. So I'm about like 30% of the way through both of those books right now. I do have a couple other smaller books that I might pick up this week. Um, one of them is a collection of poetry, and then one of them is, I think, just like a little essay or something. So yeah, I'll keep you updated. I'm gonna go relax. But cheers. time this morning I ended up participating in my very first reading sprint with Ashley from Bookish Realm and it was an absolute delight. I ended up being there for like two hours and it was so helpful to one read. I got a significant amount of the way through the babysitter which I'll talk about in a second but it was also so nice to just like hang out with other people even if it was like virtually it was just so nice to have human interaction with other people i am a huge introvert so part of me has been thriving through this whole covid mess and but like i still love people and i still miss hanging out with people and just hanging out with people in a room and just chilling and having random conversations and that's exactly what it was so it just felt so nice speaking of the babysitter i got through to like 7% of the book, so I'm almost done. I have conflicting feelings about it. The case is super interesting, and it's really interesting to hear from the girl's perspective as she kind of recounts her times with her babysitter and kind of realizing all the times where things weren't as they seemed. Uh, for example, there was a time where multiple times where he took her and her sister to the place where he buried his bodies and obviously they did not know that um and he called it his secret garden terrifying so terrifying to think of so i'm finding that fascinating and the case itself is really interesting however so the book is split up into two sections kind of it's part memoir and then part true crime so there's two different writers and the true crime portion is the one i'm struggling with 
Although the case is interesting, the writing itself I'm finding pretty problematic. It's, I understand having to explain like what happened to the victims, what happened to their bodies, what he did to them. I understand that. However, it's just the way that it's written, it seems crude and very insensitive to the victims. So I have a problem with that. And then also it takes place, so this happened in the 60s. And so there's a lot of talk about gay culture in the 60s. And the writing surrounding that is also problematic to me. So I, it's weird because I don't think I would recommend this book. But I am going to finish it because I am interested in the case itself. So that's where I'm at with that. The rest of the day today, I'm going to do a little more reading, maybe. And then my partner is a chef, so I'm going to the restaurant later this afternoon to help take some photos and to help with an event that they're having tonight outside with cute little bonfires and it's going to be precious and adorable. So excited for that. And that's pretty much it. So keep you updated. I just pushed myself to finish the babysitter and I'm having the same thoughts as I did yesterday. Sadly, this was one of my most anticipated books of the year. I was so excited about this book and sadly I cannot recommend it. <laughs> um, for the same reasons I said yesterday, the writing surrounding Tony's story, um, like the true crime portion of it was not written well. I thought it was offensive. I thought it was crude in regards to the victims and in regards to the LGBTQ community, the language that the author used and just would very homophobic and would not recommend. And also it was weird. So the, um, the memoir portion of it, it was interesting when Tony, the serial killer was in her life. I thought that part was interesting, but she really only spent like two two summers with him, which is still interesting, still very valid story that I want to hear about. But she went on to, you know, talk more about the rest of her life um, and the years after it. And it, after every chapter, it was just like her life, which is great, valid. I want to hear about her life. But then like the last sentence of every chapter was like, and then I stared off into the horizon and wondered what Tony was doing. Like, no, you didn't. You were like 10 years old. You were not wondering what Tony was up to. Yeah, so that felt very, very forced. The case itself, very interesting. So I would highly recommend looking into it, maybe in a different form of media. If there's a documentary about it, I'm not sure. If there's a YouTuber who's talking about it, maybe check that out instead of reading this book. So this past week, I got two new planners for this year. One is a wellness planner, which I just got yesterday and haven't even opened yet. So I'm probably going to do that today. But today I wanted to show you my new reading journal. It's so cute. There's dog hair on it because of course there is. But I just wanted to show you inside a little bit. So I'm keeping track of first if I'm reading every day and then how many pages I'm reading a day. Um, I'm not really keeping track of this for anything else except for the fact that I'm just kind of curious to see my reading habits and hopefully it'll help me actually be motivated to read every day, which so far it's working out great. And then I'm also using the books finished page so far. Um, so these are all the books that I have read so far in 2017. Oh my God, 2021. How am I that far off? So these are all the ones that I finished in 2017. I just said 2017 again. Oh my gosh, 2020. I need more coffee. I still need to add a babysitter, but I'll do that. There's also sections for books to read. I put kind of my must reads for this year here. And then there's places to like write little reviews. And I think I'm only going to use the reviews for my five-star books because I think there's only 50 pages of reviews and that's not gonna last me a year. 
and it's just super cute. I'm excited to use it to be a little more organized this year. And yeah, I just wanted to show you. I'll link this journal down below in case you're interested in it. It's adorable. It looks cute on my bookshelf. That's kind of really all that matters, right? So I quickly just read Light for the World to See by Kwame Alexander. And this is such a short little, little book. It is a short poetry collection that's told in kind of an illustrative way. And I thought it was really lovely. I don't want to give it a star rating because it was so short, but I loved the introduction. I thought that was brilliant. I also thought it was really well done in its simplicity. I thought it was really powerful and the repetition was brilliant. So I would highly recommend reading this one. I read it on my Kindle, but I wish I would have had it physically because I think the illustrations would have been more powerful that way. But I also started Necessary Rebirths, which is another poetry collection by Nicole M. Lawn. And I just got this in the mail in exchange for an honest review and I'm super excited to read it. The cover is stunning. And I, I think it's a poetry collection about energy and maybe spirituality. I'm hoping that it stays more on the spirituality side than religious side. I'm not a religious person, so I don't really connect with those kinds of messages, but I am very excited to see what it has to say. <laughs> pages of Necessary Rebirths and I'm liking it so far. I think that it has a lot of similar things with a lot of poetry collections. I like some of the poems. Some of the other poems are okay. I really love the poems that are more autobiographical. The other poems in here seem to be a bit filler. So I'm curious as to why they're in here. But that being said, I am really liking the ones that seem to be more of a story about the author's life rather than just musings here and there. So we'll see my final thoughts on this soon. But that being said, I think I'm going to end the reading vlog here. My partner is coming home from work soon and we will probably just relax, enjoy each other's company and just have a chill Sunday night because we all deserve it. So I'll see you hopefully next week for another reading vlog. Hope you have a great week, a great weekend. Love you all. Bye.